You are now watching Islam. Dum, 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 dum. Islam don't. And the girl can't give you Islam don't TV. Your one stop for info on Islam articles, advices, seeking knowledge, reputations, and misconceptions against Islam. On today's show, Taqwa Tunes, a poem about a Muslim girl journey to wearing the headscarf. Tazkiyah, how shaitan customizes his tricks for people based on their weaknesses to fulfill his ultimate goal. Revive a sunnah, covering up the sins of our fellow Muslims. Islam Today, news from around the world. And on our Islam Dunk special, we'll be interviewing world-renowned scholar Dr. Abdullah Hakim Quick about the rise and fall of Muslim civilization and discuss practical steps necessary to bring the Ummah back to his former glory. I feel all eyes are on me. Digging deep in my soul like a hole, I am transformed into something I am not, but I am aware. 360 degrees and it don't stop there. There's smiles all around, but the smiles don't mean what they seem when they see me. Their smiles seem hungry. I'm aware. I'm aware of my hair flowing down on my back that is bare, that is flesh for the eyes, and then say, I don't care. But the truth that is there, underneath all this hair, is that I am aware. Of the stares, of the glares, of the smiles, of the glower, the winking, the waving, the halidoran. Now as those eyes search keenly, I see what they miss. Probably, most likely, the most striking thing around me. The blokes look straight past what I see and all I see is beauty. Because my eyes just captured the most beautiful thing in my sight. And what do I see? Nothing. Nothing glitzy, nothing exposed, nothing blinging, nothing on show, nothing at all. And now I look down at myself and I'm thinking, there's so many things that I just got wrong. Beauty is that which is hidden, not on show or to woe. Now I understand that more. Wallahi, I am free. So they can go ahead and call me oppressed as I glide in my straightened hijab, because frankly, they don't make me cross. It's their loss. And really, I just don't give a toss about my body not showing, because now I know I am beautiful. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu salam ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man walah Amma ba' Welcome to you again in the Tazkiyah session in Islam Dunk TV show Today we will talk about the tricks of shaitan and how he works on the mankind to deviate them from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah said in the Quran describing the tricks of shaitan when shaitan said that I will sit to them on your straight path and I will try to uh, stop them and I will come from the right from the left in front of them from their back until I make them lose the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also Allah said subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran that the shaitan is an enemy to you so take him as an enemy because a lot of people nowadays, they think that their enemy is the poverty or their enemy is the economic problems that they have or their relatives or their neighbor or whatever they have. But the real enemy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa talked in the sunnah is the shaitan. We start to proceed in our uh, moment of tazkiyah about those tricks and they are six in number. Number one, he tries to work anew on every single individual in the universe to make them commit kufr which is the total disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala partnering having partners beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala worshiping someone else other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or denying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being someone who is away 
from any type of worship, even if it's Ahl Kitab. So, that's the first aim for shaitan, to make you a kafir, a disbeliever. If he fails in this, he moves to the next level. So that's the highest level. Number two is to make you commit bid'ah. And this could be shocking for many people. How come bid'ah is mentioned before a lot of problems, a lot of tricks that shaitan might use, and a lot of people might think that are very important. Bid'ah actually is very close to kufr because bid'ah is innovation in English and it means to institute something in religion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not order like Bani Israel used to do is not something easy it could be it has many uh, uh, divisions and, and definitions we don't want to go through this but it could be in aqidah in the faith you could have a bid'ah faith like people who believe that there is a prophet now this is a bid'ah in the belief because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is khatamun nabiyyin is the sealed of the prophets peace be upon him and all of them the third trick of shaitan or the uh, trap that shaitan tries to make human being fall into is the major sins the major sin is the sins that are mentioned in the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and he counted them and they reach up to 70 or 70 plus like killing the uh, innocent soul and eating the money of the orphans uh, stealing, lying, zina all those come under the major sins so if you look at it kufr, then innovation, then major sins if you succeed and shaitan fails to make you fall in all those three major traps he goes with you to the gradual level he takes you step by step, baby steps as we say and he makes you commit minor sins or he tries to make you fall into those minor uh, sins like looking at the haram or uh, doing haram actions which we do it daily unfortunately a lot of people do those actions daily uh, and the, it's for them uh, for those type of actions it's very easy uh, to um, be granted forgiveness as the Prophet وسلم, said to the man who uh, committed uh, like uh, touching for a non-mahram woman so the Prophet وسلم, told him to uh, pray and then when he prayed then he said your sin is uh, forgiven or after he prayed with the Prophet وسلم, the Prophet told him that your sin is forgiven but that does not mean to take it easy because the minor sin could be the path uh, or the way to the ma major sin and to the next one which is the innovation to the last one which is the kufr so that's the steps of shaitan but uh, that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran warning us from following the steps of shaitan that فَلَا تَتَّبِعُ الْخُطُوَاتِ الشَّيْطَانِ لا تتبع الخطوات الشيطان Do not follow the steps of shaitan The trap of shaitan Do not fall into it Because as soon as you belittle from the minor sin And you say This is just a minor sin As soon as you say that You fall into the ma major sin Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Considers the one who does the minor sin On a regular basis To be a major sin Let's say someone Smokes in front of the people And he does that every day then this becomes major sin when you disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala openly without being shy or afraid of his punishment may Allah protect all of us what about the person who succeeds to escape from all those four that we mentioned so far from the kufr, the bid'ah, the major sin and the minor sin what does the shaitan have to do with him? most people would say mashallah this brother or sister uh, is a successful person and his, his way to Jannah is open actually you'll be surprised if I tell you that there's two more levels that are very dangerous and the shaitan always uses them the number five one is the uh, mubahat or what we call it things that are neutral things like talking 
or uh, eating or drinking or uh, doing things that you do daily life in daily life if you do it in an excessive way if you sleep too much or if you talk too much it might lead you to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indirectly it might lead you uh, to miss salah or to uh, be busy with other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be forgetful of the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is very high level for shaitan to aim for you to make you busy in halal stuff to make you busy let's say with your wife you spent 23 hours of your day with your wife and just for the sake of argument you spend a lot of time with uh, your kids or a lot of time in your work which is not haram anyway but the shaitan uses it as a mean to make you reach to the minor sin which is you might do something haram in the process or you might do major even you might delay salah which is a major sin or you might leave salah until the time goes out and until the next time comes for example some sisters they talk on the phone for hours and hours and some brothers they would chill with friends for hours and hours and that would lead either to backbite or to make a gossip namima which is from the major sins so it's very important to be aware of this trick of shaitan lastly number f number six is the mafdul most of us probably they never heard of this the mafdul is an action that is actually an obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it could be praying it could be uh, the fighting your hawa your nafs fasting for the sake of Allah praying the night it could be any major ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala why should I want you to do this ibadah because he's afraid that you might do ibadah that is higher than this that is more rewarding that's more beneficial to the community that's more uh, disobedience to him and to his desires and his plans that's more pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like what the Prophet said sallallahu alayhi wa in the hadith that خير الأعمال أدومها وإنقل the best actions the best deeds are the deeds that are continuous even if it's a little the deeds that are continuous so shaitan actually fears those type of action because those type of action tend to change the, pe the person himself and then he works on his friends and his neighbors and his family may Allah make us from those who pass all those tests and and uh, tricks of shaitan أقول قولي هذا أستغفر الله لي ولكم سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك ونتوب إليك وصلى الله على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل على محمد يا رب صل عليه وسلم اللهم صل على محمد يا رب صل عليه وسلم اللهم صل على محمد يا رب صل عليه وسلم وجه دنيانا لذاك يا تلا ضابي شعا بالرمال السافيات وجه دنيانا لباك بدموع السجيات يا تلا ضابي شعا بالرمال السافيات اللهم صل على محمد يا رب صل عليه وسلم هذه الدنيا سراب للنفوس الضاميات كلما لاح بقرب منها قرب الأمنيات كلما يزداد بعدا كالنجوم النائات اللهم صل على محمد يا رب صل عليه وسلم اللهم صل على محمد
محمد يا رب صلي عليه وسلم لا يطيب العيش يوما رغم كثر المغريات فحياة المرء رهن بالهموم العاتيات لا يطيب العيش يوما رغم كثر المغريات You are now watching Islam. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to Islam Today. This is Jibril K. Host. It's been almost a month since the revolution that took place in Egypt and the world is left in the shadows of confusion of knowing whether this was a good and proactive and positive movement or whether it was a negative movement. Now, of course, the world is standing by watching and um, the eastern uh, countries such as Libya, uh, Oman and other countries are also on the verge of moving towards the same direction. It seems like the Arab world and the Muslim world has looked at Egypt as a guide, as a basically uh, an example for this kind of, for this movement. The instability of the Egyptian uh, population, the instability of the Egyptian system has led to many revolts, many um, re revolutions, smaller revolutions are taking place across the country, uh, people are calling for reform and so on. It's been going on basically for the past month and um, we have to understand that somehow the instability of the country is, is actually causing instability in the region. The plight towards democracy that people have chosen to take uh, did not seem so favorite, uh, that which seemed so favorite at that point is not so favoring uh, today. Stability versus instability is something that has to be looked at when such um, em emotional, I would say, um, choices are being taken by people. Revolts, instability in society, instability in social measures, instability in economy are something that is very damaging, not to the population itself, but to the whole region. Of course, when you have a fire, a fire tends to spread. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't befit anyone to sit and criticize any system, or it doesn't befit anyone to sit and criticize any people when they are not there, when they don't understand why they are there. So. It is not the purpose of this report to criticize Egypt, to criticize the Egyptian people. These reports are just to basically give food for thought for people about what's going on in the world today. What's happening with the Muslim Ummah? What's happening with the people? Not just the Muslims, but everyone in general. We need to understand that there are alternative motives for some of the events that are taking place. The Egyptian people have suffered so much at the hands of oppressors, at the hands of colonizers and conquerors for the past, you know, hundred years with the British, with, you know, the, the uh, government that was instituted, the people that followed and so on, and finally culminating with Hosni Mubarak for a leadership for about 30 years, accumulating in the the uh, vicinity of about 70 billion dollars when people are starving in Egypt. The Egyptian population has suffered dramatically. The children, the women, and so on and so forth, while certain people have lavishly lived their life and have provided for their families and have established systems where no one was able to prosper except those whom they wanted. So the question for today's show is, we're from here. When will the world get involved? What's happening? People are watching by. Some are getting involved. Definitely the world leaders are speaking about this issue. But why? Why would anyone care about the Egyptian people? Why would anyone care what, what happens to them? See, my, my brothers, sisters, my dear fellow watchers, uh, viewers, and so on and so forth. This is not about, this is not a war of, 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 of democracy. This is not an apply towards democracy. This is not really even about systems and governments. This is about the people. What are the people to gain from all these things? 
What are the people from, to gain from oppression? What are the people to gain from regions uh, that are basically making their purpose of living off the back and the hard work of millions of people? And we, as we know, the, the Egyptian population is, one of the, is the biggest population in the Arab world. So where from here? Where will the Egyptian people go from here? Will they go towards democracy? Will they go towards uh, a more Islamic oriented system as the Muslim Brotherhood is calling for? What is happening? Is anyone going to be willing to accept, for example, an Islamic system? Is that democracy itself? Would a democracy dictate that that is allowed? Well, what will happen? Will the army keep on with the power and, and keep on hold? We have to understand what's going on in the world. What, what will be the next step for Libya? The pro-supporters of, of uh, the present Libyan person and the, those who are anti. Why is it so important for the rest of the world, for example, for such changes to happen in these countries? And from my understanding, and I, say, I think there's something very clear and self-evident, is that the resources that are present in this country, such as oil, play a very big role in whether people in the world care or not care about the Egyptian people. Where people can come and say, oh, we're here to help you. But yet in the end, they just want to plant another oil extracting device that can basically assure that their country will prosper and that they will have gas to put in their cars so they can go and live their own lives. This is Jibril K reporting for Islam today. Salaamu alaykum. futana, talaqu dunya wa khafu al-fitana, nadharu fiha falamma alimu annaha laysat lihayin watana. Ja'alu halujjat. And now our Islam Dunk special, an interview with Dr. Abdullah Hakim Quick. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is Omar Malik from the Islam Dunk TV show. Uh, today we have a very special guest with us, uh, Dr. Abdullah Hakim Quick. Uh, doesn't require too much introduction as uh, he's a world-renowned scholar, uh, but I just want to give a little bit of information about uh, who Dr. Abdullah is. Uh, Dr. Abdullah Hakim Quick is uh, the head of Islamic History Department at Al Maghrib Institute. Uh, he has served as an imam, as a teacher and a counselor in USA, Canada, South Africa and West Indies. Uh, he has also traveled over 60 countries, so uh, mashallah he's a very experienced man. Uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Abdullah Hakim Quick here. To, uh, to be with us on the Islam Dunk TV show. I want to first of all gear our question towards uh, what exactly was uh, the, gold, uh, the golden ages of the Muslim Ummah uh, briefly and how it was called the dark ages but what exactly happened in it and what caused the fall of the Muslim Ummah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam wa ba'd Islamic history really is the history of humanity and uh, it's important for us uh, to begin to um, look through the veils of ignorance and misunderstanding that has clouded um, history in many parts of the world. And we have looked at concepts like Christopher Columbus discovering America and uh, Magellan discovering the Pacific, Vasco da Gama discovering a way around the Cape of Good Hope, and we realize that you cannot discover a place if people are living there already. So terminologies that are being used in many cases do not convey the real truth or a more objective position uh, for what they are supposed to be dealing. In the case of Islamic history, we know that um, the last Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he was not the first Prophet of Islam, but he was the Khatam or the seal uh, of the final prophets and messengers. And uh, in his Arafat sermon, he sent his followers out, he told them after he gave them a beautiful message, that they should take this message to all those who were not present. So the companions of the Prophet actually moved out, and it is reported that the majority of them actually died outside of the Hijaz area. And you'll see his companions making it all the way to China, far north to Russia, deep south to the Swahili coast of East Africa, all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. You'll see them in many parts of the known world uh, spreading the teachers of Islam. One of the beautiful things that the Prophet, peace be upon him, taught was that we should seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave and that um, you know, knowledge uh, is something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And so therefore, when Muslims encountered other civilizations, they didn't destroy their libraries or reject their information, but they assimilated that information into um, the, the world understanding of Islam. And it was through that uh, assimilation uh, that we were able to uh, filter out um, some of the negative uh, parts of the knowledge and to keep uh, what was positive. And so we can say that the period between approximately 622 AD uh, until about 1492, and I'm just using these numbers arbitrarily, that, that in this period, it's like an 800 year period, this was the golden age of Islam in that the Muslims took in the knowledge of the ancient ones the knowledge of China, the knowledge of India, the knowledge of Europe, Africa. And they gave it a Tawhidic understanding, the unity of God, unity of humanity, the unity of sacred and secular knowledge. In uh, Baghdad, uh, under the Abbasids, the Khalifa Mahmoud, he even had what is called Bayt, Bayt al-Hikmah, the house of wisdom. And he would bring Hindus and Buddhists and Christians and Jews and Muslims and Zoroastrians dealing with scientific issues or dealing with math, or dealing with uh, medicine, and sit them all down together, have them debate the issue, uh, and then come up you know, with the strongest uh, positions in these areas. And so that knowledge was assimilated, translated into Arabic, given a Tawhidic uh, type of impetus, and it was through that that Muslims were able to uh, change the course of history. And we find that, uh, for instance, um, the, uh, the, the Khalifa Mahmoud, he commissioned Al-Farghani uh, to look at Ptolemy's uh, book on uh, astronomy. And he actually came up with uh, a, a book on astronomy that was used in Western Europe and, uh, and West Asia for like 700 years. And so um, we were able to bring the knowledge together and we took theoretical knowledge and made it into precise knowledge. We were able to take the theories of the Persians and Chinese and Egyptians and Greeks and Romans and put them into precise sciences in order that they could be used in the modern era. So the scientific method, historical method, um, this type of uh, sifting through knowledge, you know, getting facts and then uh, testing them and coming to a conclusion, uh, if it's positive, you keep it. If it's negative, you test it again uh, until you get the highest level of understanding. That type of scientific method was actually developed by Muslims during this age. So this was the golden age of Islam. In Europe, they used the terminology, the Dark Ages. And they say that when the Roman Empire fell, um, that say the period that spans between, say, 500 AD till about... Um, uh, 1500 AD, that, that this period they call the Dark Ages, that the lights went out. And maybe the lights did go out in parts of Western Europe, but it didn't go out in the world. It was the Golden Age of Islam. So when we look objectively at that time period, Islamic history, especially when we look at Andalus, we look at Granada and Cordoba and Valencia and Toledo and Seville, this is not just Islamic history, this is world history. Because knowledge and civilization is like a baton, which is being passed from one relay racer to another. And so we had the baton during this period for over 800 years. We were the leaders of civilization, the leaders of humanity. Uh, now, uh, the natural question that comes to mind is, uh, what really brought, brought us down? What would be the cause? Well, we, are, we find in uh, Surah Al-Rad, the chapter of, of the thunder, that Allah Azza wa Jal tells us, uh, Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change that which is in themselves. And so the high level that we got to would not have been changed if we didn't change something inside of ourselves. We became greedy, we became tribalistic, we became racist, uh, we loved the dunya, the life of this world, we were treacherous with each other. Uh, and when these divisions came in and corruptions came in, some people started drinking wine. They started committing adultery and fornication. When these corruptions came in, we lost it. A civilization went down. And uh, Al-Andalus is probably one of the clearest examples 
of the rise and fall of civilization. You see when after 711, when Tariq ibn Ziyad rahimahullah, uh, opened up uh, Spain and Portugal, and then Abdurrahman al-Dakhil came in after the 40-year period, you then see the rise, and it rises by the year 1000, Cordoba is the largest city on earth. But then you start seeing the kings enjoying the life of this world too much. They're building huge palaces. They're spending most of their time in leisure. They're not calling to the good and forbidding evil. And when that happened, then the forces of polytheism, the Trinitarians, started to come back and take the territories. And we actually went down. We started to abandon the Sunnah. We were divided. And when that happened, the power and authority was taken away from us. One of the great historians of the world, Ibn Khaldun, who wrote his Muqaddama, which is an introduction to a world history, he looked at the relationship of people to the environment, to the society. How do the people interact with each other? And, and, and he found out, and this is the basis of modern day sociology and the historical method, that human beings, you know, especially he looked at the Muslims, when we were practicing Islam, we were ethical, we had justice, Allah gave us authority. But when we lost this, when we left it, and we became corrupt, then it was taken away, and we went to the bottom of the circle. So it's like a, like a cycle. When we're positive, we're on the top. When we're negative and corrupt, we go to the bottom. And so this is a, 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 a cycle which is constantly happening uh, throughout Islamic history. So um, that brings me to my next question is, uh, just like we lost our identity in Spain and Andalus, um, there, you mentioned in your class the concept of a melting pot. Uh, with what's happening with uh, North America and our youth, uh, with uh, what we've noticed is a situation with the ident identity crisis, where, uh, and you kind of touched upon that too, so if you could please uh, relate that with the viewers and what you have seen with your travels with what the melting pot exactly means. Yeah. Well, you know, within Islam, uh, we look at humanity as one. But at the same time, Allah tells us that He made us into uh, nations and tribes. Shuruban wa qabail. So we are made into nations and tribes that we should know one another. And so that is the basis of a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious society. And that is what some of the Western countries claim that they have. And that is a place where you are part of a, of a so-called democratic society and you live there in peace and justice, but you can, main your, you can maintain your identity. The problem that happens is many of these societies, and we especially see it in America today, where they become melting pots. And I use the example of a pot where you make soup. If you put in your carrots and your meat and your potatoes uh, and you know, you're cooking the soup, um, after, say, you know, a short period of time, you can still see the carrots. But if you let that soup cook too long, your carrots are dissolved, your meat is dissolved, everything becomes a type of soup or porridge. So similarly is society. When people do not maintain their identity, they do not maintain their language, their cultural values, their ethical values, they melt down in the melting pot of society. So this has happened to Muslims. In many cases, I travel throughout America and uh, Central America, South America, and I found that there were many Muslims who actually lived in these lands. There's Mecca, California, but there's no Muslims in Mecca, California. There's only palm trees. You go down to Central America, you will find Arabic-speaking Muslims in Honduras, in Costa Rica, in Nicaragua, in Panama, all the way through. There are 100,000 Arabic-speaking Muslims in Caracas, which is the capital of Venezuela. There are many thousands in uh, Argentina. In Brazil, there are more Lebanese than in Lebanon. There are more Syrians than in Syria. But what happens in many of these societies is that the Muslims do not maintain their faith. They do not revive their teachings with their youth. And so their youth melt down and they become a regular part of society. And so you become Honduran or Panamanian or Brazilian or you become an American, what is an American? What is a Canadian? Uh, you eat your McDonald's, you wear your Levi's, you go to Baskin Robbins, you drink your uh, Tim Hortons in Canada, Dunkin' Donuts in America, um, and you're a regular person, you eat your donut in the morning, and you pay your taxes, 
you know, and you live and you die like a good cog in the machinery. So this is how the society is set up, right? It's like a factory. But what Islam is saying is, we can live in society, we can live with people of other faiths, we can, but we should maintain our identity. The Prophet ﷺ said, Men tashabbaha biqawmin fahuwa minhum. Whoever appears like a people is one of them. And that uh, appearance is not only in dress, it's character. Character really is the most important thing. Do we swear? Do we um, uh, act vulgar? Right? Uh, are we acting savage? Do we look towards gangsters and bank robbers as our heroes? Or do we you know, look towards those righteous, pious people who have established justice in the world? Do we look towards X-Men and um, mutant creatures you know, as our heroes? Or do we know about the great men and women who have established Islam throughout the world? They have amazing stories, amazing feats. That is important today for us living in the West, especially, that we should maintain our deen. We live in the society. We're part of the society. We can contribute to the society. But at the same time, we need to maintain our character, akhlaq, you know, our ethics, this adab. We, we maintain that. Even though people around us might be swearing, drinking alcohol, fornicating, gambling, you know, we don't have to follow them, especially when they're going toward hellfire. How to revive this, uh, the Ummah now that we know what the problems are. Uh, and we'll talk about what's happening in Egypt and uh, some thoughts about that. So inshallah, stay tuned for our next show, inshallah, where we'll be discussing these two things. I uh, thank Dr. Abdullah Hakim Quick for his uh, presence with us. Jazakallah khair. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inna lillahi ibadan futana, talaqu dunya wa khafu alfitana, nadharu fiha falamma alimu. Join us next time for a new special edition of Islam Dunk or check us out on islamdunktv.com.